family. Uh, it's good to see you on this beautiful Lord's Day. Uh, it's also Palm Sunday as uh, we uh, remember uh, the, um, Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem um, days before he suffered and died and was raised. And so there's some artwork in your bulletin in the back that is a collaborative project between Bear Vickery and Elijah Norman. And uh, it's there for you at some later point to uh, contemplate what, uh, what it means for Jesus to enter into Jerusalem, not on a war horse to overthrow the government, but on a donkey, on, uh, in a humble posture, in a way that would identify him as the Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. I want to welcome you. We're also uh, almost um, done with our missions month. And so uh, shortly, we're going to hear uh, an update from T. Mac Howard, uh, Delta Streets Academy. And uh, we also want to remind you that we uh, want every one of our members to be thinking about ways to be a part of missions. And uh, we do that by giving, uh, by going, uh, and by praying. And uh, the session has been working through uh, what that looks like for the next uh, fiscal year as we think about making some changes to Faith Promise, but we want you to know that we are, uh, we are still uh, want to encourage you all to be giving and to be praying and to be going, but be on the lookout for uh, something uh, new here soon. With that being said, a few announcements. Uh, first, I want to draw your attention to um, Redeemer Explored. If you've been visiting with us, our new, Redeemer Explored is our new member class, and you do not have to join the church. But if you want to learn more about Redeemer, um, our history, our theology, um, why we do what we do, our mission, our vision, then we'd love for you to join us um, beginning next Sunday. Communicants class, that's the class for our children. Families, if you have young children and they have uh, made professions of faith, then we would love to have them join us for that class. Uh, we send uh, our elders, uh, we'll teach them uh, what it means to be a communing member in the life of the church. They'll sit and get to know other elders and give a credible testimony and be admitted to the Lord's table. And so um, that's for uh, our third through eighth graders. Redeemer Young Adults is going to be doing an identity seminar, and this is where we would love to have uh, you to express interest. We need about 20 people to sign up in order for us to make this happen. And so please use the QR code, reach out to Jermaine Van Buren, and uh, he'll get you signed up. We also have a lot of graduates, both uh, from high school, but also uh, college and post-college work. And so if you're a graduate, we would love, the office would love to know so that we can recognize you. But for our uh, high schoolers, uh, Stephanie uh, and Wilson will, will be put, and, and Stephanie and Wilson will be put together a, a book, and we, we'd love to include reflections from the broader community uh, to encourage our high schoolers as they make that transition to what the Lord has in store for them next. And with that being said, we're going to show a video. Jimmy and Andre, y'all got that ready? It's T. Mac Howard, Delta Street Academy. Thank you. Delta Streets Academy equips young men by providing a Christ-centered discipline and education. We promote the highest achievement in academics, a biblical worldview, a competitive athletic environment, and character development. The formal mission of Delta Streets Academy is to equip young men by providing a Christ-centered discipline education. When, when I personally think about what our mission here is, it's, it's to share the gospel uh, with each and every young man that walks through these doors. And during that process of having them here for eight hours, uh, we also have the opportunity to equip them academically, mentally, emotionally, through character development, and then we also do that through athletics. Delta Streets Academy and the teachers are reaching uh, a segment of the population in Greenwood that really needs uh, some guidance and help and instruction. And what we're finding is that they're becoming successful students and successful in life and growing spiritually. And so that has a tremendous impact on our community to have these successful students come back and impart 
to others in Greenwood the lessons that they've learned here at Belt Streets Academy. Specifically, our teachers have a major influence in the lives of our students because they're the ones that are with them for 50 minutes uh, at a time each day. And so it's, it's super important that the teachers that we have be followers of Jesus Christ, that they not only be Christians though, but that they also embrace our mission statement because that's going to help make sure that when they are in the classroom with students, that they are holding them accountable and, and encouraging them in every way that, that the young men would be successful. Whenever I would say something that was wrong, they would be quick to call me out on it. And they, were, they weren't like, they didn't speak to me like I was a baby. They explained it to me like I was the young man growing into the man I'm supposed to be. I appreciated the level of respect they gave me, so that made me take them a lot more seriously. Coach Howard, he was a mentor, he was a teacher, and he always steers us to keep pushing, never settle. You know, he was like a father figure. When I graduated Death Street, I wasn't going to go to college. Coach Howard insisted on me going to Mohead. I graduated from MDCC in 2019. Kohal came to my graduation, and he always said, keep going. And it helped me a lot with Milwaukee too, because when I first started at Milwaukee too, I started off as an assembler. I worked my way up all the way to machine tech one, where I work on machines and help assist others, you know, where they needed it. And I feel like it helped me a lot because it helped me interact with the different personnel that I had to deal with as a machine. Amen. Please stand as the Lord calls us into worship. The Lord calls us into worship from the book of Isaiah, chapter 53, verse 1 through 6. Hear now God's good and holy word. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like the root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Amen. You may be seated. Let us pray. Oh Lord God, all we like sheep have gone astray. We know that we have been created for better. We know that we have the good and better portion in you, and yet so often we go astray. O oh, Father, bring us back to you. Guide us back to that narrow way which leads unto righteousness. Guide us back to living in your presence. O oh, triune God, it is you who we worship right now, you are our God as we prepare to celebrate your son's resurrection. We thank you so much for your power. Your power that says to death, where is your sting? Your power that says to fear, oh, where is your power? Your power that says to darkness, where is your hold? For we are children of the light, and we walk in the day. Oh, Jesus, would you be magnified right now? 
become the center of our worship. For we will make room for you. Take over and reign. You subdue us to yourself and you call us your bride. Oh, Holy Spirit, help us and lead us and guide us right now. In your name I do pray. Amen. Christian, hear now this assurance of pardon from Romans 8.1. There is therefore now no condemnation, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us stand and sing our song of preparation, Promises.
faithful. Amen. Come on, let's put our hands together. For he is my. Oh, you're mine. 
God we serve. He is enthroned in the heavens and the earth. He's the only God we serve. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. All right. But the same, Keita. Your Old Testament scripture reading comes from the book of Ruth, chapter 4, verse 9 through 17. Book of Ruth, chapter 4, verse 9 through 17. Hear now God's good word. Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, You are witnesses this day that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belong to Elimelech and all that belong to Kilian and to Malan. Also Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Malan, I have bought to be my wife, to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. That the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gate of his native place. You are witnesses this day. Then all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you act worthily in Ephrathah and be renowned in Bethlehem. And may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah, because of the offspring that the Lord will give you by this young woman. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife, and he went in to her. And the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without a redeemer, and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Amen. And now Grant Callum will lead us in pastoral prayer. Grant. Good morning, Redeemer. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Please pray with me. Lord God, what a gift it is to gather with your people in this place. Thank you for meeting with us this morning in worship. We are here reading about your faithfulness, singing about your faithfulness, and now praying about your faithfulness. You are a promise making God and a promise-keeping God. And we declare your faithfulness over and over, not because you need reminding, but because we do. Thank you for this opportunity to reset our sights on you, to quiet the noisy voices of the world and to listen to the Holy Spirit. Lord, worship reminds us that you are big and we are small, that you are mighty and we are weak that you made us and saved us and have prepared good works for us. You remind us that we are pilgrims on a journey, that this world is not our home, that you have gone to prepare a place for us and that you are coming again, that where you are we might be also. One day we will worship in spirit and truth and all will be made right. Thank you that you're making all things new. Lord, we can worship you anywhere. We can worship you in our cars or in the woods or at our place of work because you're always with us. And yet, none of those places are a replacement for the sacred nature of corporate worship. You have appointed this time and place for the ministry of your sacraments, for gathering together with the body of Christ, and for us to sit under the preaching of your word. Every week you show up and you lead us by your grace and we are blessed. Lord, the work that you do here is mysterious. We don't fully understand it, and yet this is truly holy ground. And we come not on our own merit, 
not because we deserve to be here, but because of the finished work of Christ, who has paid our debt, who's washed us clean and removed our sins as far as the east is from the west. On this Palm Sunday, Lord Jesus, we rejoice that you set your eyes on Jerusalem and willingly went to the cross. You wept over the city with deep compassion for what was to come. You knew you would be beaten, whipped, and killed by the very people you came to save. You knew that our sin would cost you perfect unity with the Father, and yet you set your eyes on Jerusalem and willingly went to the cross. Thank you, Jesus. This mission month, we continue to lift up each of the missionaries supported by Redeemer Church, some who serve you from the far reaches of the globe and some who serve you here at home. This morning, I particularly lift up T. Mac Howard and his team at Delta Streets. Thank you for this school that is ministering to young men and their families in Greenwood. Thank you for the light they are in that community. May they be the hands and feet of Jesus. Please bless this ministry and bring much fruit from their work. Lord, I lift up to you the needs of our people here at Redeemer, and they are many. I pray for those who are out of work, those who are struggling financially, those who are working to mend broken relationships and difficult marriages. I pray for healing for those who daily struggle with chronic pain, anxiety, depression, and other illnesses. We ask for continued grace and healing for our sister Lydia Abraham, who continues to suffer from Mito disease. And Lord, we praise you for the children you continue to add to our midst. Your word says, behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. So thank you for Oliver Fields Burcumpus, son of Ryan and Kelly Burcumpus. May this child come to know you at an early age and walk faithfully with you all his days. I thank you for this body of believers you have called to be your church. We are the bride of Christ, but we are far from perfect. We so often fall short of the love described in 1 Corinthians 13. We aren't always patient and kind. We are far too quick to give up on people, to write them off. Father, forgive us. May we strive not to be a perfect church, but to be a repenting church, quick to move towards those we have hurt or who have hurt us to repent and confront, humbly working to repair broken relationships. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. That people would know we are Christians by our love, and your name, King Jesus, might be glorified. I now lift up to you Pastor L, as he continues to preach from the book of Genesis. Speak through him to us and change us by your spirit. And we ask all these things in the mighty name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. I invite the ushers forward. As they're coming up, if you would find the connect pad, which should be on the inside of your pew, and fill that out and complete it and pass it down the row. Now let's ask the Lord once again to bless these tithes and offerings. Father, every good gift comes from you. Thank you that you bless us. Uh, with financial resources to steward. Lord, give us wisdom in how we steward it. And now we take a portion of what you've given to us and we give back to you. Lord, use these monies to expand your kingdom. In Christ's name we pray, amen.
Amen. Can we praise the Lord one more time? Thank, thank you, choir. Thank you, musicians. Man, it is exciting to open up God's Word, uh, trusting that He'll show up, that He speaks, that He receives our praise, that He is worthy to be worshipped, and we don't have a God who's like the gods of this world. They don't have mouths, and they don't have minds, and they don't communicate. They are impotent, and we come to a strong and mighty and active and present and uh, teaching God, and so uh, we, we honor him. If you have your Bibles, I'd invite you to turn to Genesis uh, 29. We're going to be finishing up Genesis 29 and making our way halfway through uh, Genesis 30, and as you find it in your Bibles or on your devices, I first want to say thank you to the team who served yesterday as we kicked off uh, Holy Week with a block party inviting our neighbors and our community, and we had great food, great fellowship, uh, Easter egg hunts. Uh, I, saw, I heard people reading the Bible to children, and so thank you for those of you who could make it yesterday. I also want to draw your attention to our Good Friday service. It's a practice here at Redeemer that we rotate between a Monday-Thursday service uh, and then a Good Friday service. This is our year for a Good Friday service, and we're going to be looking at the seven final words of Jesus. And so myself and Pastor Zach and Pastor O'Brien and Pastor Wilson will each be unpacking uh, some of those words. But we are also inviting Anthony Forrest uh, and um, Bentley Crawford, our RUF pastors, and Jerome Douglas, who's going to be our new uh, Director of Neighborhood Outreach and Missions. He's also going to take that seventh word. And so we'll each have five minutes uh, to unpack, I know y'all are laughing because you're like, how you go get seven preachers to, to all preach and be done in 35 minutes? Uh, but we're going to try it and we're going to see what the Lord does. And so come out uh, this Friday night, six o'clock. It's time to worship, a time to sing, a time to pray, but a time to consider Jesus's final words from the cross. And that culminates in Easter Sunday. So next Sunday, um, invite a friend, invite family members who uh, have not maybe been walking with the Lord. Um, my mom is already inviting tons of people from our family. It's actually been beautiful to see. So I encourage you, if you have friends who've not been uh, near the church or have walked away from the faith, we'd love to engage them and worship with them next Sunday. Let's pray, and then I'm going to jump right in, all right? Jesus, you're so worthy, and you're so beautiful. Long ago, many times, in many ways, God has spoken to us by the prophets, and in these final days, he's spoken to us by his son, that all that we need to know about you, Lord, you have revealed in the second person of the Trinity. We know what you're like. We know what you love. We know what bends your heart. We know what breaks your heart. We know how much you love us because you have shown us that no greater love exists than a man would lay down his life for his friends, and Jesus would even lay down his life for his enemies. And so thank you. Father, all of the scripture is about Jesus, and so we pray that we would see Jesus even in this text this morning. Forgive the sins of the man who reads your word and preaches your word, and forgive the sins of your hearers. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Genesis chapter 29, starting at verse 31. When the Lord saw that Leah was hated, the Lord opened her womb. But Rachel was barren, and Leah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Reuben. For she said, Because the Lord has looked upon my affliction, for now my husband will love me. She conceived again and bore another son, and said, Because the Lord has heard that I am hated, he has given me this son also. And she called his name Simeon. Again she conceived and bore a son, and said, Now this time my husband will be attached to me, because I have borne him three sons. Therefore his name was called Levi. And she conceived again and bore a son, and said, This time I will praise the Lord. Therefore she called his name Judah. And then she ceased bearing. When Rachel saw that Leah bore, when Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, she envied her sister. She said to Jacob, Give me children, or I shall die. And Jacob's anger was kindled against Rachel. And he said, Am I in the place of God? who has withheld from you the fruit of the womb? 
Then she said, here is my servant Bilhah, go into her so that she may give birth on my behalf that even I may have children through her. So she gave Jacob her servant Bilhah as a wife and Jacob went into her and Bilhah conceived and bore Jacob a son. Then Rachel said, God has judged me and he has also heard my voice and has given me a son. Therefore, she called his name Dan. Rachel's servant Bilhah conceived again and bore Jacob a second son. Then Rachel said, with mighty wrestlings, I have wrestled with my sister and have prevailed. And so she called his name Naphtali. When Leah saw that she had ceased bearing children, she took her servant Zilpah and gave her to Jacob as a wife. Then Leah's servant Zilpah bore Jacob a son. And Leah said, good fortune has come. So she called his name Gad. Leah's servant Zilpah bore Jacob a second son, and Leah says, happy am I, for women have called me happy. So she called his name Asher. And in the days of the wheat harvest, Reuben went and found mandrakes in the field, and he brought them to his mother Leah. Then Rachel said to Leah, please give me some of your son's mandrakes. But she said to her, is it a small matter that you have taken away my husband? Would you also take away my son's mandrakes also? Rachel said, then he may lie with you tonight in exchange for your son's mandrakes. When Jacob came from the field in the evening, Leah went out to meet him and said, You must come in to me, for I have hired you with my son's mandrakes. So Jacob lay with her that night, and God listened to Leah, and she conceived and bore Jacob a fifth son. Leah said, God has given me my wages because I gave my servant to my husband. She called his name Issachar. And Leah conceived again, and she bore Jacob a sixth son. Then Leah said, God has endowed with me a good endowment, for now my husband will honor me because I have borne him six sons. So she called his name Zebulun. Afterward, she bore a daughter and called her name Dinah. Then God remembered Rachel, and God listened to her, and he opened her womb. She conceived and bore a son and said, God has taken away my reproach. And she called his name Joseph, saying, May the Lord add to me another son. Amen. That's trifling, ain't it, y'all? <laughs> so, uh, in our passage, we get, a, we get a, a bird's eye view into Jacob's complicated relationships. I know your Bibles might say Jacob's children, and I would not put that there. I don't like that heading. I don't think it does justice to what's happening here. I would put rocky relationships and God's relentless grace. Everywhere Jacob has appeared in the Bible thus far, it's been through rocky relationships. He came out of the womb grabbing his twin brother's ankle. His own father loved his twin brother more than him. His mom loved him more than his twin brother. His own mother helped him deceive his blind father to take the birthright and final blessing that was due the older brother Esau. Esau, his twin older brother, was so angry with him that he wanted to kill him. And so Jacob has to leave in order to stay alive. And you might be thinking he's going to leave one dysfunctional family and ride into the sunset and everything that he does from there is going to be neat and beautiful and peaceable until you realize he runs into a trifling uncle who deceives him, who has favorites with his daughters, who switches the wife and makes him marry his older, unattractive daughter. And you think that when Jacob marries, his new family is going to be functional and healthy, and it is broken. In our passage, we encounter pain and jealousy and competition and depression and passivity and insensitivity. And if we're honest, we experience these things in our relationships today, and even our families sometimes. And I'm glad it's in the Bible, 
God could have glossed over this. He could have left this out, but he inserts it. He, he puts this family kind of up and, and lets us have a bird's eye view into these relationships that, that, these, that, that are rocky. And I think he does that for a few reasons. First, I think it's here because on some level to remind us that we're all hardwired for relationships. We're hardwired. We come here pre-programmed with this need and this longing to be connected to other people. And it's to remind us that we'll all experience immense heartache in those relationships. It's to remind us that God alone, who is love, can love you perfectly and only him. And finally, it's a reminder that when we drink deeply of God's love, it changes us. We stop putting this pressure on people to meet all of our needs. Our needs are met in Christ and he captivates us with his beauty and his love and his patience and his grace. And when we receive that, we're able to lean into relationships with other people in a healthy way. And so that's the art that I want us to think about this morning. The first thing I want you to think about is that all of us are hardwired for relationships. So what I want to do is I want to talk briefly, really briefly, about a study. It's called Hardwired to Connect, the New Scientific Case for Authoritative Communities. You can go read it. Um, Multi-year study looking at um, the, the, the nature of us and our brains being hardwired to connect with other humans. Now, here's what the science is telling us. And obviously, we don't need the science. The science is actually proving what the Bible already says. But the science says that we're born to form attachments, that our brains are physically wired to develop in tandem with other people through emotional communication, faithful presence. And this begins even in the womb before words are even spoken. And so this study says the weakening of authoritative communities in the United States is the principal reason why, the num why, why we have scores of children who are failing to flourish. Children who live in, and, and notice when they're defining authoritative communities, they're talking about earthly families, but they're also talking about faith communities. That children who grow up in, with, with sound earthly families or in faith communities, where people come alongside and encourage and nurture and discipline and spend time with and have appropriate touch, that these children who are in these authoritative communities, they struggle less with depression, less with anxiety, less with suicide, less with teenage sex, less with emotional stability and behavioral issues. One doctor says that we discovered that in mice, during nurturing experiences, that it has a powerful effect on emotional reactivity of the offspring and it produces a permanent change in behavioral responses to stressful situations. In other words, mice that receive nurture in licking from the, the, the older mice, that something changes in their brains that enables them to deal with stress and heart, well, stress, not heartache, that, that we don't know that they experience heartache, but stress, right? <laughs> stress, they're able to deal with stress better. This same study goes on to say that men who get married, who become sexually bonded to a spouse, in a healthy way, it lowers testosterone. And this connectedness to a woman it guides men away from bars and brawling and tomcatting around and towards washing dishes and making sure that children do homework. You catch that? <laughs> All right, I, I hear you. Something happens, right? Bonding to a significant other that it physiologically changes you and you don't want to go be Mr. Tough Guy in a bar anymore, right? Like, that's the correlation that they're, that they're trying to make, that, that secure attachment and presence with a significant other, that it alters who we become. And it's even true for those who are not married. 
those who are single, who have deep friendships, stable, safe, and present community, that they too struggle less with depression and anxiety and loneliness. This explains why Jesus, who was single, was rarely alone. He had friends who would lay on his shoulder. He would have meals. He would have deep intimacy. Like, like hours before he's crucified, he goes to his three best friends. He says, my soul is sorrowful, even until death. He's living in community as a single man who needed the relationships, not just with his heavenly father, because he had that but also with people. The science is only telling us what the Bible has been saying. We're hardwired for relationships. And I think this this helps me make sense of the passage. You remember when when Jacob gets to Laban's house, he works for him for a month, and and Laban comes to him after a month, what can I pay you? What can I pay you for what you're doing? And notice what Jacob doesn't say. He doesn't say, give me a lot of cattle. Give me a lot of land. He is going to prosper in the next chapter. We're going to go there. But what's the first thing he wants? The first thing he wants, give me woman. Give me Rachel. First thing he wants is partner. I think it's also a window into why Laban does what he does. He has two daughters. One is Weak-eyed, one is beautiful, and Laban has watched men pass over his older daughter. And I think he knows, you too, my daughter, you need faithful community. I think it also explains how Jacob could kind of be caught up, right? When Laban switched them, and gave him Leah. I'm like, Jacob, bro, like, how did you miss it? Did you notice in Genesis 29, 22, that here's what Laban did. When Laban threw the wedding party, look at what it says. Laban gathered together all the people of the place and made a feast. You catch that? His first thing was go invite everybody. Why? Because Laban is valuing relationships. He's living in community. And it could be that the reason Jacob did not see the switcheroo coming is because ain't no way this guy finna switch up his children and the whole town is right here as witnesses. It explains why Rebecca told Jacob, don't just flee. Flee to my family. Flee to my family and find a wife. You see the thrust of the passage? It's pushing us in a way to prove that we're wired for relationships. This is why the Bible says, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. But I know that we're a room full of people who aren't married yet and some who may not be married. And the Bible also says that you need secure beautiful, connected relationships as well. Although a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A threefold cord is not easily broken. There is a friend who sticks closer to you, even than a brother. Confess your sins to one another, not your pet, not a door to other people. Forgive one another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. Bear one another's burdens. Weep with those who weep. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Some of you, for my sake and the kingdom, will lose earthly families. And Jesus says, and I will give you family. Both now, mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, and in the age to come. We're hardwired to be living in community with other people. Now, why? We know why. Because we're made in the image of a relational God who is one God and three persons. And before God made you and I, God existed with himself. 
Delighting in the Father was the Son. Delighting in the Son was the Spirit. They have been living in community as a triune God before all time and space. And when, when God made you, one thing that sets you and I apart is that we come here hardwired for connection. That's the first thing I think this passage reinforces. The next thing that I think we see is that all of us will experience immense heartache in relationships. So growing up, I love three shows. These are my top three. I love The Cosby Show, right? Don't condone what Bill Cosby has done, but I did like that show. Who doesn't remember the Gordon Gartrell show? Y'all remember that one? Well, he wants to go buy this, Theo wants to go buy this expensive shirt to impress this girl. And Dr. Heathcliff Huxtable realizes how much this shirt costs and he threatens to take the shirt back and he puts it up. And Denise, who took a beginner sewing class, she says, Theo, I can make you a Gordon Gartrell. And it's, it's like yellow and navy blue. And Denise goes and tries to sew this. Some of y'all are laughing because y'all know the episode. <laughs> And when she, when she brings that shirt to him, like one sleeve is longer than the other. It's tight. One collar is kind of hanging down. I, I, all right, I love that show. I love Family Matters. Who doesn't remember that show when Steve Urkel turned into Stefan Urkel, right? <laughs> you got it? Remember that one? <laughs> but my favorite was The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. And there is a show that, that I, if I watch it right now, I'll cry. And it's a show when Will Smith's father, Lou, came back into his life. And Aunt Viv and Uncle Phil, they all had their reservations because Lou uh, abandoned uh, Will when he was a boy. But he showed back up and he promised to take Will on this trip. And last minute, Lou wants to bail. And he wants to kind of sneak out and get Uncle Phil to do his dirty work. And Uncle Phil says, no, I'm not doing it. You need to tell Will. You need to be a man. And Lou is walking out of the door. And then you see Will Smith with his bags packed with a gift for his dad inside of his bags. And he sees his dad kind of walking out of the door. And he says, Dad, Dad, what's up? And his dad gives him some lame excuse on why they won't take the trip and said that he'll come back later and do it. And Will says, okay, sure. And then his dad leaves. And then Will go, he tries to brush it off with humor. And then he gets angry. And he says, I don't need him. He wasn't there to teach me how to shave. He wasn't there to teach me how to drive. He wasn't there to teach me how to fight. What I'm going to do is when I, I'm going to graduate, I'm going to go to college, I'm going to marry me a fine honey, and I'm going to have a lot of kids, and he can't teach me nothing about raising kids. And so you see the anger come out. And then it turns. And he says, Uncle Phil, why doesn't he want me? Uncle Phil, like, why doesn't he want me? And Will breaks out into tears, and then they embrace. When I read this passage, I can't help but import that into it. Because that's Leah, right? Her daddy has to pawn her off. That when you look at the text, look at what it says in verse 31, when the Lord saw that Leah was hated. Look at verse 30, right above it. So Jacob went into Rachel also, but he loved Rachel more than Leah. That you get this image that Leah is the one that is undesired in the text. That her heart is breaking in the text. In fact, you see it. I mean, it, say, it says that she was hated. And when you look at how that word hated is used in the context of polygamy in the Old Testament, it means that she's the undesired wife. And then you see it. You see her heartache and how she's naming her children. Now, Every name that you see, so no, notice, for example, in verse 42, 
she conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Reuben. For she said, because the Lord has looked upon my affliction, and now my husband will love me. And so there, there's, a, there's a, an equation that's at work here. What Leah is usually, there's a whole sentence that's describing her posture of heart, but she can't name a child a whole sentence, right? And so what she's doing is pulling out a verb or a thing from the big sentence, and then that is the name of the child. In every one of these births, there's a story, there's a window into how she is feeling the moment this child is born. And so you'll notice in how she names Reuben. It means a son, but look at the broader sentence. Maybe my husband will love me. Her second child, Simeon, verse 33, the Lord has heard that I am hated. Thus he has given me a son. Her third son, verse 34, Levi, now my husband will be attached to me. Her sixth son, Zebulun, in verse 20, God has given me another son. Now my husband will honor me. Do you see the thread? Every time she's naming these sons, it is in response to her husband not being attached to her, not loving her, not seeing her. And every time she births a son, she's saying, well, maybe with this child, he'll see me. Maybe with this child, he'll be attached to me. Maybe with this child, he'll love me. That's her pain speaking through how she is naming her children. But she's not the only one hurting in this text, you guys. Rachel is hurting, and Jacob is hurting. Rachel is beautiful, right? The text says that she was beautiful in form and appearance. And you think her life is perfect, but it's not, right? It says that she's barren. Jacob loved her, but there was something she could not give him, namely children. She could never satisfy every single longing of her husband. And the text says she envied her sister. She even says, give me children or I'll die. Do you hear the heartache there? Give me children or I'll die. And look at Rachel's actions in verse 15 through 16. So Reuben is Leah's firstborn son. It's the wheat season. And so somehow Reuben goes out and he comes back with mandrakes. And if you have little children, then you might remember when they go outside and they see the weeds spring up, they might pull them apart and and say, here, mommy, here, put them in a flower vase. Like little kids kind of do that. And it could be that Reuben, who's a young child, sees this purplish flower blossoming and he pulls it. And it could be that Reuben knows that my daddy don't like my mama. And my daddy don't come over here. He likes Rachel. And if my daddy ain't going to give my mama flowers, I'm going to give my mama flowers. Right? I think some of that is going on in the text. But Reuben doesn't know that mandrakes had another, uh, they were important for other reasons. That if you've watched uh, Harry Potter, right? Y'all seen the screaming mandrake scene? Like, Like, where does that come from? That comes from this old age belief that that, that mandrakes were were a part of magic. That it is believed that what they would do is either take the fruit and and muddle it or take the root and, and scrape the bark from the root and mix it into wine. And it will be it will become this love potion, this aphrodisiac, so to speak. And so when Rachel, who cannot have children, sees mandrakes, in her mind, she's thinking, if God, if I can't birth children, then I'm going to turn to magic. I'm going to do whatever it is that I can to get children. She's hurting. Jacob is also hurting. Did you notice that there's a lot of people talking and doing stuff in this text? And Jacob only says one thing, and it's in verses 1 through 2. Look at it, of chapter 30. Uh, When Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, she envied her sister. So she said to Jacob, give me children or I shall die. And look at verse 2. And Jacob's anger was kindled against Rachel. And he said, and am I in the place of God who is withheld from you the fruit of the womb? That's right theology. But brother, you tone deaf. 
His anger was kindled against her? Ain't this the woman that, that you just said that you love? Is this not the woman that you worked for seven years and it felt to you but a few days? You catch that? And now look at how we talking to this woman. He's like, woman, I ain't God. He's insensitive. In fact, Jacob does very little. He didn't pray for her. Remember, his father and mother, his mother, Rebecca, was barren. And when Isaac, his father, heard that she was barren, Isaac did not resort to concubinage. Isaac prayed. And so Jacob himself is an answer to prayer. Jacob himself has been born from a woman who was barren. And so Jacob did not learn this from his folks. That's his own stuff because his daddy didn't teach him that. In fact, all Jacob is doing in this text, y'all, is having sex. I, I just, I, I, with all these women, he's not even naming his children, y'all. Ten times in this text, it says, and she called his name, and she called his name, and she called his name. That is not normal. Do you see Jacob? It looked like he just kind of checked out, y'all. This woman that he thought would fulfill him is disappointing him. And this is complicated. This is a mess, y'all. Everybody in the passage is hurting, even the slave women. We learn from this text that no one person, even as beautiful as Rachel, can ever give another person absolutely everything that we need. We learn from Jacob and Leah how easy it is in relationships to use people. We learn how easy it is to envy those who have what we don't have. We learn that relationships are messy and complicated and twisted and competitive and hurtful. And sometimes it's in your own house and sometimes it's in your own church. Why? Because all relationships even loving ones involve people like you and I who are sometimes selfish, unloving, angry, discouraged, controlling, and idolatrous. And this sets us up to hurt people and to be hurt by people. When was the last time you hurt someone you love? When was the last time someone who loves you hurt you? Would you nod your head in agreement that relationships, though beautiful, they're hard? Which moves us to our, our third point. It's against this backdrop of heartache that God reveals himself to be the most kind, present, understanding, and powerful and forgiving friend. Saints, God alone, who is love, can love us all as we need. Have you ever stopped and thought about the ways that God himself is described in the Bible? We're told to pray, Abba, Father. We're also told that God spoke with Moses face to face as a man would his friend. We hear Jesus saying, I no longer call you servants. I call you my friend. We hear Isaiah saying, your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. Isaiah 66, as a mother comforts her child, so I, the Lord, will comfort you. You, you, you hear all of these ways that God is describing himself to us? I'm like a father. I'm like a mother. I'm like a friend. I'm like a brother. What's going on in all of those descriptors? God is screaming to us that you were made for me. R.C. Sproul says there is anthropomorphic language in the text. 
All right, so God is a spirit. Yes and amen. No one has ever seen God, the Father, or the Spirit, right? We've seen the second person of the Trinity, but, but when this was written, there had not been this, 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 this permanent joining of humanity and divinity. And so God is a spirit. He, he doesn't have ears and, 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 and human eyes and a human brain. And yet when you look at the text, it heaps up anthropomorphic language. Look at verse 31. The Lord saw that Leah was hated. Verse 32, the Lord looked upon Leah's affliction. Verse 33, the Lord heard that Leah was hated. Verse 22 of chapter 30, the Lord, God remembered Rachel and he listened to her. This is relational language. How many of you have been in conflict with another person and you say, I just don't think you see me? Or, I wish that you would listen to me. Or why don't you remember that when you do this, it hurts me. Remembering and seeing and hearing. This, these are relational terms. And here's the thing. God is subject and the verbs are all attached to him. He's the one who sees. He's the one who hears. He's the one who remembers. He's the one who gives conception. And the reason the author of Genesis is stacking this is because the humans in the text are not doing that well. Jacob doesn't see Leah. Rachel knows that Leah is second, but she doesn't hear her cries for understanding. Jacob is not remembering to pray for his barren wife. They are not looking, not seeing, not hearing. And it's against that backdrop that God says, but I see and I hear, and I know, and I remember. Where you fail, God says, I will not. And so how do you see him loving Leah? She's the first one. This is the upside down nature of the text. Rachel's the exalted one. Leah's the undesirable. But who is the one that benefits from God's kindness first? He lifts up the brokenhearted. God himself saw that Leah was hated, and so God himself opened her womb. It's as if God is saying, they won't love you, but I will. Jacob won't bring you flowers, but I'll raise you up your firstborn son. He'll bring you flowers, mommy. If you look at this, Leah actually gives birth to seven children. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Dinah. Seven. That's significant. It's this number of completion, and it is screaming that God has been completely and utterly faithful to the one that no one would have wanted. What about Rachel? The beautiful one who was barren, who could not give birth, who turned to magic, who was ready to kill herself. Give me children lest I die. And look at what it says in verse 22. God remembered Rachel. He listened to her and he opened her womb and she gave birth to Joseph. That, that, that's important. She tried magic. She tried control. And then she tried God and turned to God. And God heard her. God did not treat her like her husband who got angry. God says, I remember, I see you, I hear you. And look at what she says in verse 23, God has taken away my reproach. God has taken away my shame. What kind of shame is this? Is this shame for trying to control Jacob? Is this shame for turning to magic? Is this shame that, come, that came with a culture where you had to have children? We don't know. The Bible doesn't say, but here's what we know. The Lord is the remover of her shame. What about the servant women? They too got in on the action. God gave them two children each. What about Jacob? Back in Genesis 28, we were, God told Jacob, I will be with you and I will never leave you and I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth. And those words were told to Isaac and they were told to Abraham. And here is what's beautiful. Y'all track with me, track with me. Here's what's beautiful. All right. God told Abraham, your descendants will be like the stars and the sand. And how many kids did Abraham and Sarah have? One. 
God continued that promise with Isaac. And how many kids did Isaac and Rebekah have? Two. So over the span of Abraham's life, over the span of Isaac's life, you got three kids. And Bruce Walkie, in his commentary on Genesis, he says, envision this, that what we're reading could have and probably happened in the course of seven years. Now, why? Because when the Lord, when Jacob gets Leah, he has, uh, Jacob then has to do his a week of service. Then he gets Rachel. Then he covenants to work for Laban another seven years. And at the end, when Joseph was born, right after Joseph is born, Jacob goes to Laban. All right, bro, my time is up. Let me out. So think about that. In seven years, 12 kids are born. God is doing addition with Abraham, addition with Isaac. He is doing multiplication right here, right. Look, think about the image. Some of these women are probably pregnant at the same time. We tend to read this like it's successive, and Walkie says, don't read it as if it's successive. You're going to see Rachel with a kid, and, and then Rachel, uh, Leah's going to have some kids, and these servant wives, you're going to see multiple women, more than likely, in the same year, walking around with kids from Jacob. And that looks so gross from our perspective, right? But what is God doing to Jacob? In spite of your sin, in spite of the brokenness, I'm multiplying my promises to you. Saints, what about you sitting here right now? How do you know that God sees you and hears you and loves you and is for you? One of the reasons I had Jermaine read from Ruth is because those people in the book of Ruth are looking back on this particular passage. And when Boaz and Ruth get married, the blessing that they pray over them is may y'all be like Rachel and Leah who built up Israel. What you see happening right here, these names ought to sound familiar. You know who the Levites are. They're the priests. You know who... I won't give you that. You know who Issachar is. You know who Dan is, who Asher is, and you know who Judah is, right? These become the tribes of Israel. And scholars lock in on Leah's fourth son, Judah. And rightfully so, because in Matthew chapter 1, we're told that Isaac had Jacob, Jacob had Judah, and from Judah comes the Christ. We're told that Rachel was beautiful in form and appearance. Leah was not. Leah was despised. Leah was ashamed. And yet Isaiah 53 says Jesus had no form or majesty, no beautiful appearance. He was rejected. But our chastisement, our sins, have been placed on Jesus. And so think about the image. Leah is unsightly. Leah is a sufferer. Leah is the one that you would skip over. And then the author of Isaiah, he comes along and says, but wait a minute, Judah, the one who's born not from Rachel, but from Leah, from her comes the Messiah. If you want to see the ultimate expression of God's love for you, his faithfulness to you, his kindness towards you, his forgiveness of all of your sins, you look to Leah's great, 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 great grandson, Jesus. He is the ultimate expression of God's kindness. Beloved, do you know him? Have you moved from the place of trying to get all of your relational needs met in a spouse or a child or a girlfriend or a best friend? Do you know Jesus? Has his love for you become real? Because that's where this story is going. Saints, 
Earthly problems with people remind us of our need for God, says Paul Tripp. And the blessings we experience in relationships with people metaphor what it means to be found in him. Beloved, your hearts were made for communion with God through Christ. How do we respond to this? On one hand, I think it's like Rachel. She cries out to the Lord. But scholars have zoomed in on Leah. She was naming all of her children around her husband. Maybe he'll love me, my husband. Maybe he'll be attached to me. Even the women, the women of the city, they look at me and now they call me happy. But when Judah is born, she says, my soul will praise you, Lord. It's not about a husband. It's not about the other women. I bring my soul to you. That's how you respond. We love him. We turn towards him. We rest in him. We marvel in him. But something beautiful happens, doesn't it? When we're complete in the Lord, we begin to love other people the right way. In that same study, they did something. I'm going to close with this. They looked at mice that did not come from high licking environments. So you got a mother, she just wasn't really paying attention to you. And they took these mice and they put them and paired them with mothers who mothered well. And what they discovered was transcription, that those mice who were not born coded to nurture when placed inside of an environment of nurture, that they began to be nurturers. In other words, they were transformed by receiving affection and love. And saints, that's what the gospel does. When we who were not his children come into communion with God, doesn't matter how you were raised, doesn't matter what you experience, God himself will love you. And as we draw near, we become transformed by that. And we're able to love people well. Amen? Let's pray. Dear Lord, relationships are painful and rocky, and yet you call us in them. Father, uh, heal us of our wounds. Transform us by your love. Uh, help us, Lord, to be those who lean into relationships well and who do this, Lord, uh, in response to your grace to us in Jesus. We pray these things in his name and for his sake. Amen. Let's stand and sing, saints.
Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us. The Smiths are going to come down front and they would love to pray with or for you. Receive the Lord's benediction. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. And God's people said, Amen. Amen.